This podcast has been brought to you by Seekers Guidance, the global Islamic seminary. Help us spread the light of prophetic guidance to millions around the world by becoming a monthly supporter. Make a small donation at seekersguidance.org forward slash donate. For as little as $10 a month, you can help people find life-changing guidance. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. We are in the third section now of the chapter, Bab al-Tawakkal wa Sabr, the chapter of relying on Allah and having patience in Kitab al-Riqaq, the uh, book of the heart softeners in Kitab, uh, in the book Mishkat al-Musabih by Imam Tabrizi. So, but as we know, the third section is always re- reserved by Imam Tabrizi to kind of like round off the, the, the chapter and to bring this third section is like um, hadiths that are not as authentic uh, or they're not r- real narrated from as well-known collections, right? And it's just made to round off the fa'idah, the, the religious benefit, the knowledge benefit of the chapter. So let's get into this. Bismillah. Al-Fasl al-Thalith. وعن جابر رضي الله عنه أنه غزا مع النبي مع النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قبل النجد فلما قفل رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قفل معه فأدركتهم القائلة في واد كثير العضات العضاء فنزل رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وتفرق الناس يستظلون بالشجر فنزل رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم تحت سمرة تحت سمرة فعلق بها سيفة ونمنا نومة فإذا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يدعونا وإذا عنده عربي فقال إن هذا اخترط علي سيفي وأنا نائم فاستيقظت وهو في يده صلتا قال ومن من من يمنعك مني فقلت الله ثلاثا ولم يعاقبه ولم يعاقبه وجلس متفق عليه. So uh, let's let's read both of the let's read both of the riwayat. There are actually two that are related to. وفي رواية أبي بكر الإسماعيلي في صحيحه فقال من من يمنع من يمنعك مني فقال الله فسقط السيف من يده فأخذ رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم السيف فقال من من يمنعك مني فقال كن خير آخذ فقال كن خير آخذ فقال تشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأني رسول الله قال لا ولكن أعاهدك على أن لا أقاتلك وأن ولا أكون مع قوم يقاتلونك فخلص بله فأتى فأتى أصحابه فقال جئتكم من عند خير الناس سبحان الله هكذا في كتاب الحميدي وفي وفي الرياض رياض صالحين للإمام النبوي أوكي سو عن جابر Jabir narrated عنhu, that he went out for a military expedition with the Prophet peace be upon him towards the highlands of Najd and when he was returning with him the time of siesta in the hottest part of the day found them in a desert full in a desert valley full of thorny bushes the messenger of Allah peace be upon him came down from his mount and the people scattered about seeking shade under the trees under the trees the messenger of Allah peace be upon him settled down under an umbrella umbrella thorn tree and hung his sword upon it. We all stepped lightly when suddenly the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, was calling out to us. And there was a desert Arab, sta- a desert Arab tribesman standing by him. He said, This man drew my sword upon me while I was sleeping. So I awoke, and there it was brandished in his hand. He asked, Who will protect you from me? I said, Allah, three times. Allah, Allah, Allah. And he did not end up punishing the man, and he sat down. From Bukhari and Muslim. So that's the narration from Bukhari and Muslim. Let's continue. There's another narration that uh, Imam Tabrizi brings to shed a little bit more, uh, a little bit more light on the incident. And in another version, the man said, "Who will protect you from me?" The Prophet, peace be upon him, replied, "Allah." So the sword fell from his hand, and the Prophet picked it up and said, "Now, who will protect you from me?" So the man pleaded, "Be the best of those who took up the sword." The Prophet asked, Do you bear witness that there is no God but Allah and that I am the Messenger of Allah? The man replied, No, but I, gi- I give you my word that I will not fight against you, nor will I be among a group that fight against, fights against you. And so the Prophet let him go. When the man returned to his people, he told them, I have come back to you from being with the very best of humanity. I have come back with you from being with the very best of humanity. This is from uh, Al-Humaydi's book and uh, Riyadh al-Salahin of Imam al-Nawawi. 
So what, what, let's, go, let's go through the incident, right? We read the hadith. Sometimes you need to read hadith from multiple perspectives to put together a, an image or a, narr a, a narrative in your mind. So as Jabir, the young companion of the Prophet went out for a military expedition. Now as they're coming back, it's interesting because he said, فَلَمَّا قَفَلَ قَفَلَ means to return in the Arabic language, right? And however, a caravan, even when it's going out, it's called a qafila because the Arabs used to, used to name things for optimism. So when a caravan is going out, it's very dangerous to go out into the desert. It's, it's, you know, there's all kinds of uh, hostilities awaiting you and dangers and uh, environmental hardships. And so you would even call a caravan that is going out a qafila because it, something that returns because of your optimism that it will one day return. Right, so that's an interesting point in the Arabic language. And so he, so he says, when the Messenger of Allah came back from the military expedition, they say this was after the, Bani, the campaign of Bani al-Mustaliq, or uh, that riqa And when they were coming back, he said, I was with him. And so basically the hottest part of the day, what, they, what I call the siesta, it's called the qaylula. Uh, the zahira is the hottest part of the day in Arabic, but it's also um, because during the hottest part of the day, you tend to take a nap called the qaylula. In, for example, in, in Spanish culture, they call it siesta. So it's, it's a time when it's so hot, the body naturally starts to get tired. Perhaps you've eaten something, perhaps they prayed dhuhr, and now they take a nap for you know, a little bit of time. It's not too long. It's not like you know, it's a couple of hours. You know, it could be a very short time or it could be you know, a short space of time just so the heat, they beat the heat and they re-energize themselves. And this is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ that if we did this, we would find a lot more energy in our day. It's like you reset your, you know, the, the energy you feel in the morning. If you take qaylula, as they say, and it's hard because of modern, uh, you know, modern timetables and stuff like that. But if you do it, and even if you take a five minute, a cat nap, a power nap, um, you'll find that, that energy. So they, they, they all settle down in a valley that was full of thorny bushes, right? Thorny bushes and trees that were basically very barren. And so the, they all settled down. The Prophet ﷺ dismounted. And in another narration, he had two pieces of cloth that were shading him. And he took that and he made that into kind of like an, a, a shade. You know, uh, he hung it as a shade. And he went under this giant samura tree. A samura tree, I'll try to show you a picture uh, right here, is a large tree. It's from the acacia family. And it's called an umbrella thorn tree, technically. Although we don't go around calling it an umbrella thorn tree. You know, you have to look that up. So that samura tree, it's a type of acacia. Um, it, it has a long, uh, a long uh, trunk, as you can see, and uh, the branches spread out far, right? And uh, he settled under this tree and he hung his sword. You know, swords in, in their scabbard, they had like perhaps like a kind of a loop of leather that you would hang. And so he hung that uh, very nearby to him and in the shade they all went to sleep. So all the companions scattered. They didn't all sleep around the Prophet ﷺ. They all scattered to take shade in different trees. Just imagine if it's a small contingent or a small army, there would be a lot of people spread over a large space. And then as the Prophet is, is sleeping, in, in another narration, Ibn Ishaq mentions that at a distance, the mushrikeen who, you know, perhaps they were out to do some sort of re re reconnaissance mission against the Prophet or they were planning a surprise attack, but they were spying on the Muslims from a distance. And they realized that the Muslims had stopped to take a, a nap, to take a, to take a siesta. And so, the, the, in this narration of Ibn Ishaq, um, they tell, they send their bravest and best warrior. And Imam Zahabi identifies him as uh, uh, Awrath ibn, uh, ibn al-Hirth, or, right? or Da'thur. And they sent the best of their warriors to uh, launch basically a surprise assassination on the Prophet ﷺ. So he, so this person, Da'thur, infiltrates. He's an Arabi. Arabi didn't mean Arab. Arab, uh, Arabi and Arabi. Arabi meant a desert Arab tribesman, right? They're not used to sedentary life. They're used to um, living kind of, you know, uh, like how you describe a Bedouin today, um, you know, with their camels in 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 the deserts, not in in civil in what they call like a built-up civilization or sedentary life. And so he sneaks into the ranks of the Muslims. And imagine everyone is asleep. So he's just walking around and he sees the Prophet ﷺ, perhaps he saw him in a previous battle uh, against him, perhaps he had seen him before for some other reason. Um, he comes up to the Prophet ﷺ, right up to him, completely unguarded, takes the Prophet's own sword ﷺ, out, you know, that's hanging, draws it, and then stands over the Prophet ﷺ. Imagine pointing the tip of the sword at the Prophet ﷺ, or waving it over him. 
basically what that means is if you wake up, you know, it, it, there's no way to escape from that. It's like having a gun to your head, right? At any moment, you, you stir, that person can just run that sword right through your neck or whatever it is. Um, and so he says, and so the Prophet comes to, is, a, is awoken, and that man is just standing over him with that sword, brandished and, and drawn. And, um, and so the companion, Jabir, says, we, we had just slept a very light sleep. Like, it just probably drifted off to sleep, everything calmed down, and all of a sudden they hear, this is where they hear the Prophet calling them, right? So the, Jabir is narrating the hadith from his perspective. All of the danger has passed, right? So let's, let's go into the incident and then we'll talk about Jabir's perspective. So the man is standing over the Prophet and the Prophet wakes up and he says in one narration, O Muhammad, he says, who's going to protect you from me? Who's going to protect you from me? Like who? Out of all these companions who are around you, there's no one who can reach in time. And they're all asleep anyways. No one would even know if I just ran my sword right through. And so when he asks, who will protect you from me now? It's the point of death. It is the time of the gravest danger. And there's nothing that a human being can do. And the Prophet says, who will protect you from me? He says, Allah. And he says it again, Allah. Allah. In another narration, the, the man asks, are you f- afraid of me? He asks, so you afraid, are you afraid of me? And he's expecting the person to say, yes, I'm very afraid. Please save me. And he says, Prophet says, no then who's going to protect you from me? Allah. And when, when the man hears this answer with complete conviction and complete certainty and confidence in Allah, the man drops the sword. He, 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 gets, he freezes. The, the spiritual power of that response, of hearing Allah's name, shocks him. And he trembles and he drops his... He freezes and is paralyzed and drops the sword. In another narration, in Ibn Ishaq, it's Jibreel Islam comes and strikes him on the chest, meaning kind of perhaps just makes him freeze out of fright. And he drops the sword and the Prophet then goes, picks up the sword and takes it now and points it back at him. And perhaps the man now um, falls in shock. And uh, he's, now the Prophet is standing over him and saying, now, he didn't say now, but he, who will protect you from me? And this is where the man has absolutely la ahad. He says, nobody. And he says, he says, please. He starts to beg him now. He says, kun khayra akhidin. Akhidin means, it could mean the, uh, the, 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 the one who draws or takes up a sword, be the best of those who took up a sword. Meaning, like, you know, out of all the people who've taken up a sword against their enemy, about to execute their enemy, especially in revenge, be the best of all of those people. Meaning, please forgive me. Or it could mean from mu'akhada, which means to um, take um, retribution or punishment, be a best of those who are in a position to punish. Please. He's begging for his life now. And you know, subhanAllah, even with the Arabs, they were very proud. They, especially the desert Arabs were very proud and very brave. But he's just been completely taken apart in this incident. How many times has this desert tribesman killed someone? You know, assassinated someone? He's a hardened, tough assassin and a warrior. And now he's begging for his life. And all his pride just goes away. He doesn't even want to die a proud death. But he asks him still in a proud way. He doesn't say, oh please. He says, be the best of those who've taken up the sword. There's fear in his heart. He doesn't want to show it. And so the Prophet ﷺ then, this is where he says to him, right? He says, do you bear witness that there's no God but Allah and that, the, and that I am the messenger of Allah? Now do you bear witness? And the man says, no. He refuses to, to bear witness. However, the scholars say this moment was actually one of the greatest miracles of the Prophet ﷺ manifest to that person. Because, because you can say so, you can believe, you can, you can disbelieve in the messenger thinking he's an ordinary human being. And that's why they were fighting against him, because they thought he's just an ordinary leader. And he's, a, he's from the tribe of Quraysh, and we're not from Quraysh, so why should we listen to him? Yet, when it's time to kill that person, that leader, he has complete confidence in Allah. So that means that his connection with Allah is true and genuine. And it's that spiritual um, certainty that struck the heart of this person. And so this is where he says, No, but I promise you that I will not fight against you or join a group of people to whoever fight against you. And when the Arab used to give their word in that time, it was 
proverbial. It was legendary, even amongst non-Arabs. The Romans have a, a piece of poetry or a, a, a piece of uh, wisdom where they say like the, the, the word of the Arab, right? It was legendary in, in the surrounding empires. The word of the Arab is something that does not get broken. So um, then the Prophet let him go. He let him go. And so this, this man got up. Now, in, in the narration Bukhari and Muslim, he does not become Muslim. Right? He does not accept, embrace Islam. However, in other narrations, it is said that the man became Muslim. But he, perhaps at that time, he didn't want to um, accept Islam in a position of weakness. And so he did not uh, admit to Islam. You know, it's kind of like, I, I'm not becoming Muslim out of fear. When he got up and he went back, he became Muslim. And um, this is what they say. And then when he goes back to his people, he says, I've just come back to you from the best of humanity, the best person ever. And so imagine, what's the wisdom behind all of this? There are a number of different, first of all, there are a number of different um, uh, benefits that they bring in the hadith. Sometimes they bring these very technical benefits, like, you know, you should always have your sword hanging close to you, you know. In other words, you shouldn't be too far from your protection. You know, don't, never, 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 um, even though you have trust in Allah, even though you have tawakkul, remember it has to tie back to the chapter, you still keep your sword near you. You still sleep with your protection. Lock your door, stuff like that. <laughs> so, uh, and the other thing is <clears throat> that, um, so keeping a weapon near you is not against having tawakkul. You know, it's not against having tawakkul to do that. Um, especially if you're in a place that's dangerous, right? Rough neighborhood or something like that, a place you don't know. Um, <clears throat> and the way that everybody scattered from the Prophet ﷺ, um, actually you're not supposed to do that. The imam, it is wajib to protect your imam or your leader, right? Because, because of the harm that comes when he is harmed or he is killed. So it is wajib. But in the case of the Prophet ﷺ, they, they, the companions left. And they, some say that this incident was also the cause of revelation, asbab nuzul of the ayah of the Qur'an. Wallahu uh, ya'asimuka minan nas from Surah Al-Ma'idah verse 67 that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you from the people. So this is, uh, some say that um, it was revealed at this moment, when it, uh, that Allah revealed that at this moment, that Allah promises the Prophet ﷺ that I will pr protect you. And it is said that after this was revealed, he did not take any bodyguard. So the Prophet ﷺ slept without a bodyguard, trusting in Allah alone. Um, however, taking the means is okay. But this is a sign from Allah. That's the point, right? And it's also a sign that the Imam is allowed to forgive. The Imam, meaning the leader of the Muslims, is allowed to forgive someone who does a personal wrong to him. You notice the Prophet ﷺ forgave. Why? Because it wasn't an act, a crime against humanity or against another Muslim, where that person's rights, you, you know, he didn't, hurt, he didn't end up hurting him. So the Prophet ﷺ had the choice and chose to forgive him at that point to show First of all, also how you deal with an arrogant person or an ignorant person. Someone who doesn't know that you're the messenger. I mean, they're fighting against you, but they don't know. So give them a chance. And so the Prophet at the cost of his own life, is willing to give a chance to this person to believe. And this is the lesson, right? Bravery and yaqeen and tawakkul, it goes a long way. And the Prophet would rather <clears throat> give up his self-interest, right? Look at the chivalry, the futuwa in this. He'll give up his own protection, answer with tawakkul, Allah takes care of the situation, protects him, and he does not take revenge on this person, right? Imagine you tried to kill a king or a president or a ruler. You know, it's finished. You'd be, at least if not killed, behind bars, you know, for the rest of your life. But Allah, the Prophet ﷺ left him go in interest of that man going back and telling his people, and so they could become Muslim. So the Prophet ﷺ is thinking not about his own life, but forward through his character into what about this, the people of this man? And that, lo and behold, those people go and they become Muslim because they hear about this or their hearts are readied when they hear about it. And he still invites that man to Islam. So he's still saying, do you do, you do this? Do you do? So he's still asking him in this state. He can kill him. He's not saying, I'll kill you, accept Islam or you know, death. He's not saying that. Because even when the man says no, and this is proof that when an enemy you know, of the Muslims is, uh, is in a vulnerable position and they, they should still propose Islam, but that Islam is not Islam of the sword do or die. It's not, it's not Islam by the sword. It, this, the person still has the freedom to choose whether they want to become Muslim or not. And of course the Imam has the freedom to choose whether they take revenge or not. But the point is that the Islam at that point, the Prophet ﷺ does not force him. And, um, and that man is brave in that sense as well because he refuses in the face of death. But he follows his conviction. And when he realizes the Prophet ﷺ, Islam is not that type of religion. 
right? You have your conviction, then he will willingly becomes Muslim. So may Allah SWT make us, you know, um, firm in the face of, of any sort of difficulty in trial. Have tawakkul. This is a, a case, textbook case. In the whole chapter of tawakkul, this is where you get the tawakkul, right? at the point of death, right? And it's also like to tell us, like, if we had that kind of trust in Allah and that kind of chivalry and bravery, where would Islam spread? You know, how much more would Islam spread? You know, so that our, our predecessors, they spread Islam through this and hearts would change. So what are we doing? In the next hadith, the Prophet says, وَعَنْ أَبِي ذَرَّ رَضِي اللَّهُ عَنْهُ أَنَّ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ قَالَ إِنِّي لَا إِنِّي لَا أَعْلَمُ آيَةً لَوْ أَخَذَ النَّاسُ بِهَا لَكَفَتْهُمْ وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبُ رَهُ أَحْمَدُ وَإِبْنُ مَاجِهِ وَالدَّارِمِي And Abu Dhar narrates, Abu Dhar said that the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, Truly I know a mighty verse of the Quran that if the people were to take it up, Truly, it would completely suffice them. And it is this. And whoever is morally conscious of Allah, he makes for them a way out and provides for them from where they cannot even conceive. Ahmad ibn Majah and the Darimi. You know, subhanAllah. This reminded me that um, our teacher in Hadith, Mulana Abdul Salam, he would, um, from his tradition, from where he learned, Shaykh Abdul Salam, he would actually um, uh, recite the Quran and the Hadith in a kind of a a musical voice or an intonation, a melodious voice, I should call it. Um, so, SubhanAllah, I, I, I should one day try to venture and try to show you guys what that sounds like. Um, and this is so, and this is not the entire ayah. Uh, so, what, what, what is the Prophet I'm saying? He's saying, I know of a verse. There's one verse, a single verse that I know, that if people were to take it up, what does take it up mean? Follow it wholeheartedly. Take it as their teaching and act on it and live with this one verse. If they did that, it would completely suffice them. What does that suffice mean? Suffice is the means it would protect them from every single thing they disliked and every single thing they feared in this life and the next. It would completely take care of all of your cares and worries and fears, right? And what is that verse, right? And whosoever and whosoever is morally conscious of Allah, has taqwa of Allah, then he makes for them a way out and provides from them from whence they cannot conceive or from where they cannot even conceive. Allah will make, if you have taqwa of Allah, and um, the, the continuation of the, of the ayah, the, the, the narrator or the, the, the commentator says that the Prophet narrated the rest of the ayah, which is, وَمَن يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ And whoever has tawakkul in Allah, whoever has complete reliance and trust in Allah, then he is his sufficiency. Allah suffices him completely, and then the verse continues, and that's in Surah um, in Surah At Talaq, uh, yeah, in Surah At Talaq. So um, this is from the from the chapter of Tawakkul, and the Prophet is saying, if just one ayah of Tawakkul you acted upon that, and what is that? Is to have taqwa. So you cannot have Tawakkul in Allah and ha without having taqwa, right? You can't say, oh well, I'm going to go, you know, gamble and I'm going to go pimp, and I'm going to go sell drugs, and I have tawakkul that Allah will, you know, make, you know, it doesn't make sense to do that, right? So you have to, or like, I'm going to cheat this person, and Allah will still still make me come out on top, because my Lord is always standing up for me. You know, that kind of silly, uh, uh, you know, self-righteous, uh, er ignorant behavior. No, we have to have taqwa, and having taqwa means that you don't do things, uh, you know, that Allah has made haram, and you don't cross a line of that which is doubtful. And, and, and that takes tawakkul, because... You can get a lot of things the wrong way. The wrong way you can get a lot of things. You know, you want a certain, uh, you want to get with a certain person. Don't oh, forget about trying to marry them. Just get, just you know, commit fornication. You wanna, you wanna get some money, steal this, cheat this person. I wanna, I wanna get this thing, but I can't afford it. Just get it on interest-bearing loan, for example. So, yeah, that's the easy way. But having taqwa takes trust because you say, Oh Allah, I'm gonna have taqwa and I'm not gonna do this. But I still have trust that if this is good for me. And I, and I should get it, if I should get the girl or the or you know or the spouse, if I should get this deal, if I should buy this home or this car or whatever it is, then or this promotion, I'm gonna do it without doing anything haram. I'm gonna trust you and I'm gonna go for it without doing haram. But you still have to go for it, right? So this is the point. Now, then Allah will make a way out of your problems if you have taqwa. Allah will make a way out. So like you're in a, you're in a bind, you're in a predicament. Have taqwa. If you're ever in a difficult situation, you don't know what to do, fear Allah. And do whatever Allah 
wills. And sometimes you can you can't try to do something. When you can't do anything, then give it up to Allah and say, Oh Allah, I completely let go of my choice and my trust in myself and I give this over to you. And you'll see the path will open up for you. The the way will the, the, the trees will just like spread in the forest. The the oceans will part and Allah will show you a way out. Just try this because Allah is guaranteeing it, right? And so this is why they say also sometimes we ourselves are in a group situation and you know we're following a certain scholar or a, a spiritual guide or something and they say that the benefit of following a spiritual person a person of taqwa is not only for yourself but also being with people of taqwa why because sometimes you're in a group situation and they said in the in the piece of poetry I mean, it's not a very, uh, perhaps a very well-known piece of poetry, but I, I rendered it in English uh, in the following way. When a man is an ally of those who fear God, then let him not fear when a threat comes about. Have you not heard Allah Most High say, for those who fear God, He makes a way out. Right? So, uh, so you'll get out of your problem, and also Allah will provide for you, right? And He will provide for you from where? He didn't say He just provide for you, from where, where you cannot even imagine. You can't even expect that Allah will give you risk from that place. And Allah will give it to you in that place, right? And so whoever has tawakkul in Allah, then He is His sufficiency. Getting to the next hadith, inshallah, Wa'an ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu qal, Aqra'ani Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Inni ana razzaqu dhul quwwati al-mateen. Ruha Abu Dawood al-Tirmidhi. Very short hadith, right? Uh, and this is narrated from Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, who said, uh, who, who interesting, okay, we'll talk about this. Who said, the Messenger of Allah, upon whom be peace, taught me to recite the following verse. Indeed, I am the great provider, the one of strength, the mighty, the mightily firm, or the, the, might, the mighty, or infirm. Abu Dawood and Tirmidhi. Now, uh, Abu Mas- Ibn Mas'ud who was one of the early, early companions. He was one of the first people to become Muslim, like one of the early, early companions. And he, oh, he, up, you know, in, in the tradition, uh, as you know, the Qur'an is narrated, or, or sorry, I should say transmitted, mass transmitted, through different qira'at, different modes of recitation. Because the Arabs were diverse in their dialects, and so although the Qur'an came down in the Qurayshi dialect initially, the Prophet ﷺ asked Allah, Oh Allah, I have to go out and recite this beautiful Qur'an to other tribes, you know, who have different types of poetry, different dialects. And if I say it, basically, he didn't say this verbatim, but basically if, if the intention was that if you recite the Qur'an in one dialect, there's all this rivalry among these tribes. And so they might say, okay, great piece of recitation. We haven't heard poetry ever you know, like it. It's miraculous, but it's not in our dialect. So that's for you guys. We'll come up with our own recitation. So in order to diffuse this, uh, in his wisdom, Allah SWT sent the Qur'an down in different styles of recitation. It's still the one eternal, pre-eternal, uncreated word of Allah, right? Because with Allah, that Qur'an, when it, it's, it's, it's eternal, it is, uh, it, is not, it is unchanging, it is not with sounds and starts and stops and letters. It's an eternal attribute of Allah Himself, of His speech. But when it comes into the created realm, it becomes sound, it becomes letters, it becomes um, recited, it becomes chronological, right? How this happens, we don't understand because we don't understand what infinity is, right? We barely understand what the, the, the extent of this world is. But Allah SWT has allowed that divine speech to be manifest in different transmissions and different recitations. And uh, as we know, there are, there are uh, seven that are mass transmitted, then it goes to ten that are... Um, um, styles that we know. And now there are different opinions about the huruf of the Qur'an and the qira'at of the Qur'an, the different uh, ahruf, sorry, um, the different uh, dialects of the Qur'an. Are they the different recitations that we have today? According to one uh, very great scholar in contemporary times, um, that this is what this is what uh, it's, it represents. But there are many different opinions. So it's a long debate. But the point being that the Qur'an is preserved through these channels. Now, in, in historical texts in the Hadith, we also hear that Ibn Mas'ud had his own um, narration or uh, transmission of the Qur'an that the Prophet ﷺ explicitly taught him and that he used to recite, right? He used to recite in this style. So this uh, wording, إِنِّي أَنَّ الرَّزَّاقُ ذُو الْقُوَّةِ الْمَتِينَ is not in the transmission of the Qur'an that we have today with us. But it is narrated through hadith that 
Ibn Mas'ud heard the Prophet ﷺ narrating it this way and it was taught to him. That's why he said, Aqra'ani. He, ta- he taught it to me and rec- recited it to me. And he kept on reciting this way. However, this was not in the Mus'haf uh, of Uthman, in the Mus- uh, Mus'haf al-Uthmani. Uthman al-Uthman did not accept this transmission here. However, uh, what we know, right, and this is, a, this is a Hassan Sahih Hadith, right, from Tirmidhi and Abu Dawood is that this is not mass transmitted, so it's possible that this style of narrating or this word was abrogated later and made and adapted to what we know. Allah uh, revealed the final format of the recitation to what we know. Anyway, so that's something. Or it is that it is uh, uh, sahih in its narration and it is um, uh, part of the language of the Arabs, even according to one aspect, it is sound, but it is not according to the uh, Mus'haf of Uthman. That is the standard recitation of the Quran or the standard text of the Quran that we know today. That's a bit of a technical point. Now, what is he saying? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, I am the Razak and I am the one of power and might. And so what uh, the reason why Imam Tabrizi, why does he bring this here? Right? Why does he bring this hadith in this chapter? Because he's saying if Allah is guaranteeing that He is the one providing and He is also the one who is all capable and all powerful, then we should trust in Him and have complete reliance and tawakkul on Him. The next hadith, وَعَنْ أَنَسِ النَّظِرَ عَنْهُ قَالْ كَانَ أَخَوَانِي عَلَىٰ أَحَدِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ Right. كَانَ أَخَوَانِي عَلَىٰ أَحَدِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ فَكَانَ أَحَدُهُمَا يَأْتِي النَّبِيَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ وَالْآخَرُ يَحْتَرِفْ فَشَكَ الْمُحْتَرِفُ أَخَاهُ النَّبِيَ صَلَى Anas said, there were two brothers in the time of the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, and one of them would come to the Prophet, peace be upon him, to learn to learn knowledge of religion, and the other would work a trade and earn for them both. So the one who worked a trade complained about his brother to the Prophet, peace be upon him, who said, it may well be that you are given your sustenance through him, Tirmidhi. Um, so let's go back, let's go, this is the last of these we'll take for, uh, for today. So, the, there, so these two brothers that lived in the time of the Prophet one of them used to work and earn a living. We don't know what he used to do, but it, hirfa is a, is a trade. Um, so it's some type of physical, you know, hard, hard work in those days. And uh, the other brother used to go, did not used to work at all, and used to go and sit with the Prophet in order to learn ilm and ma'rifah, experiential knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, spirituality, the truth, the deen, so that he could preserve it. And he obviously he used to go back and tell the brother, the other brother, this is what I learned from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? So at some point, um, that brother perhaps got fed up, you know, like, you know, I'm working so hard and I earn and we both eat from my earnings. And what do you do? You just go and sit in, the, in durus all day, lessons all day, memorizing hadith, memorizing Quran. What, what work are you really doing? What are you earning here? You know, so he's trying to peg his brother's value in one sense. On, on, on the amount that he earns or the fact that he's not contributing to anything around here you know you don't buy anything around here and so that so this so this uh, brother comes to complain to the Prophet saying my brother you know it doesn't work he's just going and learning all day so the, what did the Prophet tell him very simple right three words maybe perhaps it is that you are given your rizq your sustenance because of him or through him now, la'alla could mean two things. Number one, it could mean, from the Prophet ﷺ, it could mean that for sure you are given your sustenance through him. Because when the Prophet ﷺ says perhaps, it could, you know, it's like, you know, he knows. Or it could mean perhaps in order to get that person to reflect. Maybe, think about it, maybe you're getting your risk through him. So you think that he is marzuq through you. You, you think he is provided, through, provided for through you. Maybe you are provided through for, from him. Maybe you are provided for through him. And so what does that tell you? There's a spiritual barakah of gaining knowledge, of uh, uh, being with the Prophet ﷺ, of preserving the deen, that you think you're providing for him, that little trade that you're doing? No. The blessing of what he's doing is coming back to benefit you. And this is something we have to remember in the Muslim world. Many people look at the ulama and they say, those who have freed up their time completely in order to serve the deen say, what work are these people doing? Go get a job. Go get a. Go get a. You know. Go get. You know. Go get some. Mo- make some money. Stop. Uh, you know. Uh, and 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 they 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 deride the ulama for you know being under the thumb. Un- unfortunately today of the boards of the masajid, 
and uh, asking for donations. Oh, you're going and begging from people. Astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah. This is proof that what these people are doing, perhaps all of the other Muslims who donate to these, you know, these, um, these imams and these scholars, perhaps the barakah in their life and the, the rizq that they're getting is because of these ulama and these imams that they support. Think about that. And subhanAllah, at this point, I do have to plug the, the, uh, the uh, Seeker Scholars Fund. This hadith is exactly pointing to that, especially these ulama who left Syria and they, they went to settle in Istanbul and others who studied in the West and came back, right? Um, you know, and they have no other means of sustenance except, you know, this, the people who love knowledge and love deen and want to see it preserved. Otherwise, they could all give up. I just read a post the other day um, from a brother you know, who studied deen. He's saying, I cannot answer any request to go teach because I work 12 hours a day in a factory. right? And imagine it was, if it, if it was that one of his brothers worked in that factory 12 hours a day and gave some money to his family and gave some money to his brother to go study the deen and teach it, that person would not be doing the favor to the brother. Yes, it is a type of favor. But in, in fact, the barakah that comes back into his life and the risk would be because of the work that the brother is doing in teaching the deen and spreading the deen. So inshallah, you know, with this, um, we should always try to support whatever uh, you know, uh, effort is going on to spread the deen and always try to give towards the ulama. It's not money lost, it's money gained. Not, not only for yourself and your own risk, right? But for your family, your children, all the generations, the entire ummah. Inshallah. So we'll close with that, Inshallah. And this is a uh, this is to do with tawakkul. Why? Because that brother. So the lesson here is that brother goes out to seek knowledge and trusts in Allah, and so Allah actually has someone working and providing for him. And it's not a, a leeching or parasite. No, it's a type of tawakkul on Allah that I will spread your deen, and someone else will. I, I will bring you that risk, like the birds, like I provide for the birds. And so the person who's a means of that risk coming to that scholar or that student of knowledge or that da'i, do not think you're doing them a favor. Yes, you are doing a type of favor, but it's the favor is coming back. It's from Allah to all of us, right? So, uh, inshallah, we'll stop here. Um, ask your questions on the forum, inshallah, or in the comment section. Uh, and please support. Uh, we should all support the ulama, inshallah, at least with our du'as, if not with our uh, money, inshallah, and our, and our um, support. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for listening. This podcast was brought to you by Seekers Guidance, the global Islamic seminary. Visit seekersguidance.org to access reliable Islamic knowledge taught by qualified teachers. We offer a wide range of courses, podcasts, articles, and a world-class answer service. Support us in spreading free, reliable Islamic knowledge to millions around the world by becoming a monthly supporter. Visit seekersguidance.org forward slash donate, and make a small monthly commitment today. Our beloved Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, said, whoever guides someone to goodness will have a similar reward. So don't forget to share this podcast and spread prophetic guidance.